Good morning, um, folks. Welcome to the Civil Law and Data Practices Committee. We'll all call the meeting to order. A quorum is present. And do I have a motion to approve the minutes from last Thursday? So moved. Uh, Representative Johnson moves the minutes from last Thursday. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Minutes are approved. And I was negligent last Thursday and did not introduce our new page for our committee. Um, why don't you stand up, and Rachel, and introduce yourself. Tell us uh, what city you're from and anything else we, we really need to know about you. Yeah. <laughs> I'm Rachel Kohler from Ramsey, Minnesota. I graduated from St. Ben's last May. Awesome. Thank you. We're glad to have you. Let's see. We are going to bring Representative Albright to the testifier's table. We are going to hear um, House File 2072. Uh, Representative Hoppy would like to move House File 20, or 2072 before the committee and move that it uh, be re-referred to the Committee on Mining and Outdoor Recreation. Welcome to the committee, Representative Albright. Go ahead and explain your bill. Good morning, members. Uh, House File 2072 uh, is really a, a bill that I think uh, speaks more to the state or condition of uh, most people that uh, live in Minnesota, and I'll, I'll briefly explain why I say that. Uh, our lives are, for the most part, spent accumulating stuff, uh, both real property and personal property. Now, real property, as you uh, or many on the committee probably uh, very well know already, uh, consists of land buildings and those things that are affixed uh, to the land. Personal property is anything else. So that would consider your jewelry, your personal effects, uh, cars, watercraft, uh, snowmobiles, whatever have you, uh, travel trailers. When we talk about personal property, that becomes problematic, though, because in the context of transferring that to an estate, or through an estate to the beneficiaries, it becomes problematic in terms of we have a number of mechanisms that can provide for that for real property, uh, but for on personal property, there there are some troublesome issues. Uh, those items that sometimes can become problematic when it comes to transfer include money, uh, securities, uh, insurance trust certificates, and as I have mentioned already, that I would also add to that uh, watercraft, personal watercraft, as well as uh, motor vehicles. Uh, now, men, of, uh, men and women of means uh, who have accumulated enough stuff over the course of their lives uh, have uh, either adjoined to themselves to high net worth uh, status or can use such mechanisms as trusts uh, or use various gifting strategies uh, to transfer this, uh, these types of assets uh, to their heirs or beneficiaries. Uh, however, for those that are not of means, uh, it becomes a little bit problematic in terms of finding uh, a means to transfer efficiently uh, those effects that they've accumulated over the years uh, to their heirs, their beneficiaries of those uh, that they would entrust them to. And so that is what uh, 2072 really does, is it provides an opportunity uh, very simply for those of uh, lower income means uh, to transfer those effects that uh, they typically do own. I might add that Minnesota is the lar highest per capita a state in the union for boats. Uh, we have a number of those, and even if you are not of uh, uh, substantial means, it's very likely that you have either a motorcraft uh, or a uh, automotive uh, vehicle to get around. And so what we are doing in this bill, uh, members, is allowing for one of those uh, very simple, straightforward opportunities to transfer either an automobile or a watercraft uh, to your heirs through what's called a, uh, a uh, a transfer on death, a TOD type of uh, beneficiary form. Uh, just some following comments on that. Uh, if you take a look at your brief from uh, House Research, I just want to make mention of uh, what uh, that does. It does allow a beneficiary to be changed at any time by the owner. It provides the transfer is subject to the rights of third parties and the right of a third party continue after the transfer. Uh, requires a secured interest or lien on the watercraft to remain, and that also includes for the uh, automotive, uh, automobile, to remain attached until it is paid. It does not require the beneficiary to pay any money for the benefic beneficiary designation or transfer other than the cost of a new title. Uh, it does not require the beneficiary to agree 
uh, to the beneficiary designation. And it provides that both the watercraft or the uh, motor vehicle to become part of the decedent's estate if the beneficiary does die before uh, the decedent. Uh, members, we have uh, verified uh, through uh, uh, channels that this uh, bill has been uh, supported by the Minnesota State Bar. Uh, there is no controversy that is uh, created by it, and there is Senate language identical to this moving uh, through the proper channels as well. So with that, I'm uh, happy to stand for questions. Member questions? Wow. Anyone in the audience wishing to testify on this bill, either for or against? Seeing no one, Representative Hoppe renews his motion that House File 2072 be re referred to the Committee on Mining and Outdoor Rec. All those in favor, please sig signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. You're on your way to mining. Thank you, members. Representative Hoppe, you're up next. House File 2650. I wanted to wait till Albright left because that was a terrible bill. This <laughs> is a fine piece of legislation. Uh, Representative Hoppe, would you like to move your bill and it will be going to the General Register? Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, I would like to move House File 2650. It's um, making some technical clarifications in a receivership bill that we did 2012. 2012. And right. with that, I have a, uh, a distinguished guest that can explain more of what the bill does, and uh, then we'll get on with it. Great. Welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and your title, and go ahead and with your testimony, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. My name is uh, Jim Bailey. I'm with Fredrickson and Byron. I chaired the committee that drafted the receivership bill uh, that was adopted in 2012. It was a very comprehensive piece of uh, legislation. It served very well. It's something of a national model. Uh, but our committee is back with uh, what we consider minor changes, cleanup changes. Um, and with that, I'll, I'll plunge into the changes. Or you bet. I think my task here is to do them as quickly as possible. Uh, the first change uh, at line 2.10 it's a little bit complicated. The, the receivership statute uh, changed in 2012, changed the order in which a receiver would apply certain money among uh, various expenses, including insurance, real estate taxes, and tenant deposits. And it made that more flexible. The problem is that mortgages drafted before that time referred to the prior order of the application of those funds. And so in essence, our, our statute says, as to those mortgages that were drafted before the effective date of the receivership bill, they can utilize the uh, order of the use of funds or application of funds uh, that existed at that time. At uh, line 3.1, uh, the statute contains a long list of uh, other sections of the of the Minnesota statutes to which the receivership rules would apply and when we uh, drafted this uh, we missed some sections basically having to do with uh, the control of corporations and like entities uh, because they didn't use the word receivership they made reference to equitable remedies that the court could do and that clearly meant receivership so we've added that that list of statutes to the list that already exists. At line 4.24, uh, this current statute says that the uh, receiver can pursue claims that are among the property that uh, were received by the receiver, and it seems to us that we should add that the receiver should also release, be able to release those claims. And that's been added at line five, basically at 5.7, uh, the receiver will sometimes be running a business. Uh, and so the receiver has explicit authority to employ employees, including officers, so that there could be a president of the company of which the receiver has control and the president, president would have the authority to execute documents and the like, depending on what the court order provides. Uh, at line 5.28, uh, we really cleared up language concerning 
um, what would be prima facie evidence of the authority of the receiver to uh, transfer real property. It's really, I think, just clean up. Uh, at uh, line 6.9 and later uh, when the receiver, uh, when, when the property includes an executory contract, that is a contract not fully performed on either side, uh, the receiver is, can receive the property of the contract and also can receive the services. So the addition is can receive the services and then the receiver may terminate that contract the current statute provides that that would create a claim on behalf of the other party whose who's, uh, the contract uh, uh, termination is to their detriment. But then we make uh, clear that if it wouldn't be a breach of the contract, such as if it had already run out or if it was terminable according to the contracts, there would be no claim. Um, 6.20 provides that when property is abandoned, that is the receiver can simply not take property. And what happens to that property was clear to the authors, but not in the statute. Then it goes back to the prior owner by the uh, abandonment. Um, 6.29 uh, is actually a change. Uh, the question is who may be a receiver, or there's a parallel statute, an assignee for the benefit of creditors when a debtor transfers property to an assignee and says, look, take this property and use it to pay all my creditors. Who can be that assignee? Uh, the prior stat statute back before 2012 said that that person uh, needed to be a resident of the state of Minnesota. We didn't intend that. When we drafted as to receiver, uh, we made, made that change. We just missed it in the other statute. So this now makes clear that the, that the details requirements for a person to be a receiver also apply uh, for an assignee for the benefit of, of uh, creditors, so that becomes a parallel change. Um, at, but if this person is a non-resident, then that, that person is submitting to the jurisdiction mm -hmm. of the Minnesota court. Uh, and uh, finally, uh, we have provided a short form for uh, uh, transfer of real estate when we're dealing with an assignment for the benefit of creditors. Previously, there should be a, a, a filed a copy of that assignment. Sometimes they're very long, deal with lots of things other than real estate records, and so we've created a short form uh, for that purpose. And with that, I would be happy to take questions. Wonderful. Thank you, Mr. Bailey. Any questions from members? Seeing none, any members of the audience wishing to testify either for or against this bill? Seeing none, Representative Hoppe renews his motion that House File 2650 be recommended to pass and be re-referred to the General Register. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. House File 2650 is on its way to the General Register. Thank you for your time. Representative Portman, are you ready? Good morning, Madam Chair. Good morning. Good morning. Would you like to move your bill? Um, I would love to, if I were a member of this committee, move my bill. But yeah, I think sure. John Applebaum wants to. Yes. Maybe Joe Hoppy wants to move my I'll bill. I'll move that bill. Okay. Representative Hoppy would like to move House File 2705 and recommend that be re referred to the General Register. Go ahead, Representative Hortman. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Members of the committee, uh, House File 2705 is. Um, a bill containing some technical corrections to the LLC provisions. And I have here this morning Bill Klein to explain what the bill does and why we need it. Welcome to the committee, Mr. Klein. Go ahead and state your name for the record and go ahead with your testimony. Good morning, Madam Chair. My name is Bill Klein. I am an attorney with the Great Plant Moody office in Minneapolis, and I am also chair of the business section of the Minnesota State Bar Association. I've been a co-chair of its partnerships and LLCs committee for some period of time as well. Um, the current Minnesota Uniform Limited Liability Company Act became effective just last August, August of 2015. It had been adopted a few years earlier and once it went into play and practitioners were actually using it, several of them identified some items that they wanted basically corrected. 
there were little glitches in the statute. And so the bill actually accomplishes a, primarily five things. One is that it fully integrates Chapter 322C with the rest of Minnesota statutes. Uh, practitioners identified a number of statutes that referred to the old Act, Chapter 322B, but did not refer to the new Act, 322C. This corrects it so that both limited liability company acts are properly referred to in those sections. Second, it prohibits a limited liability company from converting directly to a public benefit corporation. Public benefit corporations are Chapter 304A, where um, became effective on, uh, in January of 2015. They are a business corporation that has some objectives beyond re economic returns to its shareholders, and it was felt that it would be improper to have um, minority owners of an LLC forced to change the basic economic goals of their entity by having it convert to a public benefit corporation without some recourse. This permit, permits that to happen only if they first convert into a Minnesota business corporation. They can then convert to a public benefit corporation, but that action would require that they go through dissenters' rights that minority business owners have in a 302A business corporation. The third thing that it does is that it gives the board of a board-managed LLC the authority to grant an in a security interest in all assets of the LLC or to drop those assets into a subsidiary. Those are provisions that were contained in Chapter 322B, but when we made the change, we inadvertently omitted carrying those over. So this is basically just carrying over some provisions from the old LLC Act into the new LLC Act. Uh, fourth, it modifies certain terminology relating to conversions. A conversion is where one business entity by election of its owners and action converts into <coughs> another entity. Uh, the Minnesota LLC Act refers to the, con the change of a Minnesota LLC into an LLC of a foreign state such as Delaware or vice versa as a domestication. A number of other states do not refer to it as a domestication, they refer to it as a conversion. So this change just makes it very clear that regardless of the terminology, you can, you can make these changes from one state to another if the substance of the act permits it. And finally, this specifies certain fees for filing articles, for filing amendments and the like. The act when it was adopted simply referred to a lawful fee charged by the Secretary of State. It didn't specify the dollar amounts. This changes it to specify the, do the dollar amounts. And those dollar amounts are the same as the dollar amounts specified under Chapter 322B. So it's, it's not a change, it's just a <coughs> clarification that the fees remain constant whether you're under the old act or the new act. Uh, and that's the substance of it. I'd be happy to take any questions. Any questions from members? <coughs> Representative Pinto. Actually, um, Madam Chair, this is just a comment. I, just, I couldn't resist noting that Mr. Klein is a constituent of mine. I've worked with him extensively and uh, he's, uh, I can attest to his dedication and expertise. If, if he says this is good, it's good. Thank you, Madam Chair. <laughs> you should join the legislature. Think of the clout you would have. <laughs> <laughs> Just one person endorses you and everybody. Um, any other questions from members on this bill? Representative Lesh. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, if you join the legislature, you have to take out Representative Pinto, I think. Through right? that. <laughs> Through that. Uh -oh. Madam Chair, Representative um, Lesh, I, I assume he didn't want that to happen. <laughs> <laughs> Representative Lesh. We don't know. This is a strange place. Representative um, Lesh. Uh, as the chief author of the Public Benefit Corporation bill, uh, in the House um, a couple years back. I didn't know that this was coming out. On a cursory review of, uh, of the agenda, I wasn't tracking that this was impacting my bill. Um, so I have some concerns. Um, you, I'm sure everything you said makes perfect sense to a lawyer that practices in your area, uh, but I, I'd like to review it, actually, uh, when <laughs> the SAMPAC's a public benefit corporation, and I, this is the first time I've heard of it. Uh, so I guess I'd ask if, uh, if the author would agree to lay this over so that I can take a look at this uh, and determine uh, what impact really this has so I can understand on the Public Benefit Corporation, considering this is a first impression for um, me on that bill. Mr. Chair, what seems to Portman. make more sense is maybe to let it go to the General Register and we can address your concerns both here and in the Senate as the bill moves and, and we won't take it up on the floor until we've addressed your concerns. 
what I heard Mr. Klein saying about what the bill does is it just is talking about protecting minority shareholder rights from in, in a case of a conversion from a for-profit corporation to a public benefit corporation. And when you think about it as a minority shareholder in a for-profit corporation, if the, the structure of the corporation is to change to something else, you would want to assert, assert certain economic rights. And so to me that makes it sense, but it, and it doesn't do any violence to your bill, which, um, which I supported and was really glad to see enacted. But I think it, it deals with this peculiar situation where an investor has gotten in with a profit-seeking motive. And then um, the, the duties that are owed to that investor change if the, if the form of the corporation changes. And it's to respect those minority shareholder rights. Um, Madam, Madam, Madam Chair. Chair, Mr. Uh, Representative. Um, I, Mr. I would, Klein. I would just note that this, this change did come from the business section authors of the 304A bill. Kim Lowe was a primary person involved. And she brought it up basically pointing out that when this was put in place, they were looking at 322B, which does have dissenters' rights, and 322C does not. And that was the motivation for the change. Well, Madam that seems Chair, like a logical... Uh, no, none of the... Uh, th this was a a wide variety. This was a coalition of individuals that all worked pretty hard uh, to put this through. Uh, I didn't hear, I haven't heard from a single one of them on this bill. Um, they were pretty hard on this. I don't see any of them in the audience here today. Um, uh, I think it would be <laughs> on something that's modifying that, which we'd done so recently, I would feel far more uh, comfortable, Madam Chair, rather than kind of greasing the skids and, and sending this through to the General Register, that we lay it over uh, and actually get some input from those people that, that were the, the engine behind the successful passage of this bill, uh, uh, and at which point then we can send it to the General Register if, in fact, there are no concerns. I don't think it's an appropriate procedure to just say, well, I know that there are concerns, but we'll just send it through. and. Maybe something will happen, put it on autopilot. I, I'd ask that we lay it over, Madam Chair. Um, I'm open for other member comments, but I believe Mr. Klein, didn't he just explain that um, some of the folks, um, did you say again that the people from the um, public benefit corporations, they were the ones that brought up this topic? Is that what you said in your, just in your prior comment? Madam, Madam Chair, this did come from some of the people who were involved in, in enacting and in drafting it. Uh, as the representative indicated, I, I don't know all of the people that were involved, and it did not come from all of them. It came from certain of them. Okay. Representative Hoppe. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, we meet again Thursday morning. Representative Lesh, would you have enough time between now and Thursday to consult with people and make sure that this isn't doing bad things? I think there would be plenty of time. Okay. Madam Chair. Yeah. Representative, Madam Chair? Yes. Uh, Representative Hortman? Uh, my only issue is you guys meet at 815. But the other thing <laughs> is, uh, Mr. Klein has... It's a great start to your day, Representative Oh, Hortman. my goodness. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Klein has taken the time to come over from his firm and, and testify this morning. I don't know if it would be necessary for him to come back again. Obviously, he understands the bill much more than the author does. Um, I don't think he would need to come back since he just explained if we're just dealing with a public benefit question. I could ask Kim Lowe, my new uh, fellow Uniform Law Commissioner from Minnesota, if she would join us on Thursday morning, I, maybe. Madam Chair, I, I, don't, I don't think we would need any, any heavy testimony on this. If I can check in with the folks that have worked on this and if they're familiar with it, um, that would satisfy me. I don't think we'd need any testimony other, or any committee action other than a vote if, in fact, there aren't any problems. Madam Chair, I, would be, I will be here anyhow. I would be happy to present the bill Thursday morning, and I agree, would agree with Representative Lesh. I don't think we need Mr. Klein to come back. I, I just, you know, belt and suspenders, as they say. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, any last comments, Representative Hortman? Um, Madam Chair, members of the committee, I can get up early on Thursday as well. <laughs> All right, members, what we will do then is um, we'll take a, uh, a vote to lay this bill over until, th and take it up. Oh, I guess we don't take a vote on that. So we will just, the chair will lay it over. Thank you for your time. Until members. Thursday morning. See you Thank Thursday. you so much. I hope you have green treats on Thursday. Well, you're bringing them. <laughs> Thank you very much. I, I, I should have thought that.
Or Representative Flesh will bring the green treats because you're because we're laying over the bill for you. For you. Shamrock shakes around the table. Yes, it's true. Like a gentleman, he has. It's true. All right, Representative Smith and Miss Timmons, welcome to the committee. Good to see you this morning, Madam Chair. Representative Hoppy, have we killed a bill yet this year? <laughs> no, I don't think we have. We would never do that to Miss Timmons. We would never do that to her. Let's wait for Smith's next bill. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Do I have a motion? Well, Representative Smith, you can move um, House File 2797 if you would like. So moved. And uh, this bill will be headed to the General Register. Um, go ahead with your testimony and bill. Representative Smith. Thank you, Madam Chair. Members, House File 2797 is the revisor's bill that corrects citations and spelling and other errors from prior legislative enactments. And we would like to, I would like to uh, ask for some testimony from our expert. Wonderful. Welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and go ahead. Um, thank you. I'm Michelle Timmons, the revisor of statutes. And Madam Chair and members, um, we have a 297-page uh, uh, revisor's bill this year. It's bigger and better than ever. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and we have actually four articles, so I just thought I'd give you a brief overview of what's in each article. Uh, the first article is the miscellaneous one that you're used to seeing that corrects miscellaneous errors, mostly cross-reference errors. Uh, but this year, because we had a, a longer interim, and we um, also in, in the 2015 uh, budget cycle, um, the legislature was kind enough to give us some additional money for computer staff. So one of the things the new um, computer staff did is write a program to find uh, references in the 24,000 pages of Minnesota statutes that reference repealed administrative rules. And so with that new program, we found a lot of uh, references that were out of date. And that's one of the reasons why you'll see that Article 1 is larger than um, usual this year. Then moving on to Article 2, I think um, all the members of the committee are aware that the General Assistance Medical Care, or GAMC, program um, was repealed by the legislature in 2010. And we found that there were still quite a few references to the GAMC program. So Article 2 really cleans those up. Uh, we did a special project and worked with um, both House Research and Senate Council to, to get that uh, prepared for you. Moving on to Article 3, that is a cleanup um, of some income tax uh, provisions and it doesn't make any substantive changes. It simply recodifies um, the numbering scheme and gets things in a, in a proper order so they can, they're understandable. This was fully vetted. Uh, Joel Michael from the House Research Department worked intensively on this with, with uh, the revisor's office as well as staff from Senate Council and from the Department of Revenue. So um, this article has been fully vetted. And then finally, last but not least, um, I know that members of this committee are very familiar with Chapter 13, the Data Practices Act. And the structure that was put into place, oh, I don't know, maybe 15 years ago now, in which there are sections that, in Chapter 13, that summarize and cross-reference Data Practices Act provisions that are codified elsewhere in the statutes. And so Article 4 just makes some cleanup provisions to those cross-references to um, keep them in tune with legislative action from past sessions. So with that overview, if there are any questions. Members have any questions on the revisor's bill? How many people work on the revisor's bill? Well, there are 14 of us uh, attorneys up in the revisor's office. So every attorney in the office, and I should acknowledge Jeff Case, who is uh, in the audience in the front row. Uh, Jeff is the assistant deputy for drafting who puts the bill together. 
then of course, you know, this is a big proofreading project right. and uh, we have actually about uh, 20 people back on what we call the deck who um, will work on this in terms of data entry and proofreading. And then of course it's reviewed by all the people from House Research and Senate Council as well. So it's, it's a large effort. Right, sounds like it. Seeing no member questions, is there anyone in the audience wishes to testify for or against this bill? Seeing none, uh, Representative Smith renews his motion that House File 2797 be passed and re-referred to the General Register. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. The bill is on its way to the General Register. Thank you, Ms. Thank Timmons, you. and thank you, Representative Smith. <laughs> Folks, uh, Thursday we do have a pretty full agenda. And be prepared, you know, if we don't get everything fit in in the morning to come back in the evening, on Thursday evening. And with that, we are adjourned. Well, civil law or is it our expectation that real ID is going to skip this committee uh, representative Lesh thanks for that question um, the second round the second bill that deals with real ID will have to come to this committee this one really doesn't have to it really deals more with transportation and just repealer of the of the 2009 bill Representative Lesh okay well I I have to I'm not that familiar with it to know but I'll, I'll take your uh, your answer at face value madam chair thank you the, the second bill will be coming here for for sure okay and it'll be a much more detailed bill but yes thank you for the question bring your passport <laughs> <laughs> all right with that we really are adjourned